All right, we're going to get started. Hi, everyone. Thanks for taking time out of your Monday afternoon to join us here. Um, we're really, really excited to talk about cell free technology and BioBits and how it works and how it's used. Um, we're just going to start off by introducing ourselves. So, I am Dr. Ali Huan. I just got my PhD from MIT last year in biological engineering, where I was working on the cell free technology and developing BioBits. And now I work at Mini PCR as the BioBits program lead to bring BioBits into your classroom. Um, Jess, do you want to introduce yourself as well? You are muted, let me unmute, okay, there you go. <laughs> Thanks, sorry about that. Hi everyone, my name is Jessica Stark. Uh, I am currently a postdoc at Stanford. I, like Allie, got my PhD last year from Northwestern University, um, and before that did undergrad uh, at Cornell University. And I also did a lot of work on with cell-free technology during my PhD and with Ali co-developed BioBits kits, which you'll hear about later in the talk. Awesome. So just a few housekeeping before we get started. Uh, this uh, this webinar is being recorded and we'll post it to the mini PCR YouTube account after the fact so you can view it there as well. The slides will also be available as well and if you have any questions you want us to answer please direct them to the Q&A function in Zoom and either one of our moderators will answer it live for you or we will address it at the end. Uh, if there's any technical issues or any other comments, you can direct them to the Zoom chat. The Zoom chat will uh, get the chat straight to us panelists and we can address the issues from there. But yeah, if there's nothing else, we'll just dive on right in. All right, so let's take a step back. And when we think about biotechnology, that might sound like something very modern. Technically, biotechnology is defined as using, using living systems to develop or make products. So with that definition, we've actually been using biotechnology for thousands of years, even before we knew what DNA, proteins, or even cells were. One of the earliest examples is agriculture. Farmers would select and breed the best and the strongest plants to survive and grow enough food for the community. Another example, uh, people have been adding yeast to foods to convert it into another form, whether that's beer, wine, or bread. So even before we understood the science behind this, we were already taking these living systems and putting them to work to create something that we need. Once we learned more about biology, we were actually able to expand how we harness the power of living systems, specifically cells. So cells have the molecular machinery to make proteins, proteins which are essential tools that help cells and us survive and grow. And if you think about DNA, DNA contains the genetic info or the instructions needed to make all these different proteins. So we can transfer the specific DNA instructions into say bacteria cells, we can grow them up and use them to make specific proteins. The example shown here is insulin. These bacteria cells have been given the DNA instructions to make insulin and we are now able to use these cells as a mini factory to produce insulin for uh, patients with diabetes. This can be done as well for other protein-based medicines, say vaccines, or antibodies. We can also use other molecular processes in cells to carry out, say, biochemical reactions to make things like biofuels, bioplastics, and other useful chemicals. So overall, cells are a really useful factory to make all these products that we need. However, using live cells isn't the most straightforward thing. The main issue is we need to actually be able to keep these cells alive. Once we you know, transfer those DNA instructions to the cells to make proteins, 
we need to grow them in a liquid culture. So some of you might have actually grown cells in a test tube in your classroom or your lab, but for a medical or an industrial application, you actually need many, many more cells. So you need things as shown here, like these giant tanks and piping to be able to hold the cell culture. And this is pretty costly, as you can imagine. It takes time and you know, the people running these tanks need the expertise to know how to do this properly. In addition, cells are still gonna carry out their own processes. They're not just gonna only make the protein that we want. They're gonna use resources to also make other proteins to keep itself alive. And in the end, we're gonna need to be able to separate our product, the protein that we want, away from the rest of the cells, which again is another costly, complex process called protein purification. There are also limits to what products we can actually make in the cells. Again, since we need to keep these cells alive, they need to be able to make things that aren't too toxic or that are harmful for the cells. So what I'm kind of getting at here is overall, the process of making proteins from live cells can be very expensive, time consuming, and complicated. So it's often limited to you know, research labs or industrial companies with a lot of resources. So the question is, how do we make this cheaper and more accessible to people like you? So if we go back in time to the 50s and 60s, 1950s and 60s, this is around the time where scientists were trying to figure out molecular biology. They were trying to figure out how proteins were made. Around this time, you know, Watson, Crick, and Franklin had determined the structure of DNA. Scientists you know, generally knew that DNA held the genetic instructions for making protein, and they had gotten the gist of how transcription works, right? How DNA goes to messenger RNA with uh, RNA polymerase. But they weren't exactly sure how this step worked, how translation worked, how that messenger RNA then goes to protein. They weren't sure how the nucleotides, which make up DNA and RNA, were translated to the amino acids that make up the protein. So in 1961, a groundbreaking experiment was done by Nuremberg and Matai, where they broke open these E. coli bacteria cells and yanked out the contents inside. And then by adding different combinations of RNA, to this extract and seeing what proteins were made in response, they were able to discover the first codon. And just as a reminder, codon is made up of, you know, it codes for three nucleotides per amino acid. So when the ribosome is doing translation, you can go from the messenger RNA shown here and translate it to the amino acid and for the proteins shown here. So after this experiment, they were quickly able to figure out the rest of the codons and figure out how translation worked. And for his work, Nuremberg actually won the Nobel Prize in 1968. Not only did this work show how the central dogma of biology worked and how proteins were made, it was one of the first examples of how live cells were not needed to carry out transcription and translation. And you could just use a cell-free system. You could just use the stuff inside of the cells that contained this molecular machinery for transcription and translation. So there and other subsequent experiments have shown that you know the cells may hold all this molecular machinery, but they aren't essential or they're not needed for the molecular machinery, things like the polymerases for transcription, the ribosomes for translation, and the kind of way to wrap your head around this, this analogy, is imagine you have a car and you took the engine out of the car. You can actually still take this engine and hook it up to other things and have it work. And this engine is perfectly functional outside of the car. It's not essential for it to be inside the car in order to, for it to function. Similarly, to get cell-free extract, what you do is you first grow up cells in, uh, grow up live cells in liquid culture. 
and then you get the cells harvested out of the culture, usually by centrifuging them to separate the liquid from the cells, solid cells, as you show here. And then the next step you need to do is you got to bust open the cells of a process called lysis. A very common way to do this is to vibrate the cells until they explode. And then once that happens, you scoop up the st stuff that's inside. So, you know, at this point, you're grabbing the RNA polymerases for transcription, you're grabbing the ribosomes for translation. And once you have the stuff inside the cell, the cell extract, you need to add other things back in as well. So in order to build things like the RNA for transcription, you need nucleotides. In order to build proteins, you need amino acids. So you gotta add that back in. And then you also need to add an energy source. So for example, ATP to be able to get, you know, transcription and translation, these processes to work. After all of that, all you need is to just add DNA. And then whatever DNA you add, it will undergo transcription and translation. DNA will go to RNA, will go to protein. And at the other end, you'll get the protein that your DNA encoded for. And I think someone just put it in the chat. Again, we'll touch a little bit upon this at the end. Um, but if you're interested in learning how to do this in your own lab, we're gonna talk about it in the Q&A section. But for today's talk, we're just gonna focus on what you can do with this extract once we, you have it. So as is, this cell-free extract would still need to be stored in expensive freezers and transported on dry ice because the, you know, the proteins inside the cell-free extract, the ribosomes and the polymerases, are still gonna degrade if you leave them too long at room temperature. So we have this process called freeze drying to make it last longer. Think about if you had an ice cream cone, for example. If you let the ice cream cone out at room temperature for too long, it's gonna melt. But what you can do is you can freeze dry it, which means you freeze it with liquor nitrogen and then you suck out all the water and you end up with this dry solid so now you have this fancy astronaut ice cream you can take anywhere you want or even up into space and it's not gonna melt because it's now preserved like this. We can do the same thing to those cell-free extracts to get these little pellets shown here. And see if I get this up to the camera, you see those little pellets at the bottom here? Those are freeze-dried cell-free extracts. Sorry, I think this is the background. All right, but as you can see here, And so now we can actually transport these freeze-dried cell-free reactions to more places and not have to worry about it spoiling. And at the other end, all you need to do is just add water that contains DNA, and then the reactions will happen that will go from DNA to RNA to protein. And again, whatever protein that that DNA encoded for is what you'll get in the end. So, Cell-free reactions were used at first, you know, back in the 60s, to figure out basic molecular biology. Today, though, it's being used in a variety of different applications, including improving current biotech approaches in medicine, biofuels, all those examples that I showed in the beginning. So in graduate school, uh, Jess and I both worked on applying freeze-dried cell-free technology to different applications. So now I'm going to turn it over to Jess, and she's going to talk about some of the projects she worked on in grad school. Great. Spotlight your video. Hey, Allie. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Um, if we want to go to the next slide. So as Ali mentioned in the first part of this talk, the real power of cell-free systems is that they allow us to make proteins without cells. And as a reminder, the process by which proteins are made in, uh, in biology is called the central dogma of biology. Uh, and this is the process by which information stored in a DNA molecule is transcribed by RNA polymerases to make RNA, which is then translated into a protein. And this is called the central dogma of biology because it is so critical for all of biological function. Really everything that biology does is underpinned uh, by this central dogma. So if we can carry out the fundamental reactions of biology and cell-free systems, this will now allow us to take 
biology to places where cells can't go, where we can't establish big factories with lots of uh, large tanks and, and piping and refrigerators, refrigerators to store cells. And so I'm gonna talk about three different examples of ways that scientists are now using cell-free technology to benefit society. So if we wanna to go to the next slide. One example is using cell-free systems as biosensors that can detect contaminants or pollutants in the environment, such as in drinking water. If any of you remember the water crisis in Flint, Michigan in 2014, uh, this was an event where hundreds of thousands of people were exposed to lead through contamination in their drinking water, which is a poison. So this really underscores the need to be able to uh, safely and accurately monitor water quality to ensure that people have access to clean drinking water. So to address this need, scientists at Northwestern University have developed cell-free biosensors that we could take out into the field to test for water quality. And the real um, innovation here is that they use this special sequence of RNA that acts like a switch. Uh, this RNA sequence, when there's no contaminant present, it doesn't do anything, the switch remains off. But if there were a contaminant like lead in your water and it's put into this cell-free reaction, the RNA molecule would wrap itself around that contaminant and cause a reporter enzyme to be made. And we call this enzyme a reporter because it can catalyze a chemical reaction that will produce a yellow molecule. So the color will, or the reaction will change colors reporting that the contaminant is present. And scientists have now developed a variety of different biosensors that can sense a variety of different either chemical contaminants or additives in water. Some examples are antibiotics, metals like lead, but also things like fluoride that we put in the water to help build strong teeth. And also because Ali mentioned that these reactions can be freeze dried and transported without the need for refrigeration, it makes it really easy to think about taking this technology out into the field to test for water quality. So uh, I think this is going to be a really exciting area where cell-free systems can make a difference in the future. Next slide. Another way that we can use cell-free biosensors is in disease diagnostics, which are tests that, can that we can use to diagnose someone with a particular disease. As a proof of concept, scientists from MIT developed a diagnostic test for the Zika virus. If you remember, this virus caused a pandemic in South and Central America in 2015 and 2016. Um, and it was causing birth defects in pregnant women who were infected with this virus. So you can imagine it's really important to understand who might have this virus uh, in order to control the spread. So in this test, the researchers used a very similar RNA switch, but in this case, you can kind of think of this molecule as a lock. So when there's no virus in a patient sample that you're testing, the lock stays closed. Uh, and the reporter enzyme is not made. But when genes from the Zika virus are present in the sample, those genes fit into this RNA switch almost like a key going into a lock, opening up the sequence of RNA so that the reporter enzyme can be transcribed and translated. This particular reporter enzyme causes a color change from a yellow substance to a purple substance. So when scientists see a change from yellow to purple, they know that that particular sample and that particular patient is infected with the virus. And so we've talked about how systems, these cell-free systems can be freeze-dried in test tubes, but in fact, these researchers showed that this test could be freeze-dried in paper, and that's the picture on the right-hand side of this slide. Um, and so this makes it really easy to start to take these tests out into the field and really rapidly test people for whether they're infected with this virus. Next slide. Another technology that we can use in cell-free systems is CRISPR. And likely a lot of you have heard about CRISPR in the news, but you may or may not know how it works. The real, the real power of CRISPR technology is the ability to program a CRISPR-associated enzyme or a Cas enzyme to, to cut or cleave a specific sequence of DNA. 
Um, you've probably heard about CRISPR uh, and its applications in editing the human genome to treat genetic disease, but it turns out the ability to cleave specific DNA sequences also makes CRISPR very powerful for disease diagnostics. So the idea here that was developed jointly between scientists at MIT as well as at University of California, Berkeley, is that if you could take a, pan a sample from a patient, and if that uh, sample contained DNA from a pathogen, you could amplify that pathogenic DNA up, amplify meaning, meaning make many copies of that DNA sequence, until that sequence was present at a level that it could be recognized and cut by the, the Cas enzyme. So when this cleavage happens, we get some kind of reporter molecule, a color change, a fluorescence, something that would tell the scientists that there was pathogenic DNA in that sample. And this idea could be applied to test patients for cancer, whether they've been infected by a bacteria, whether that bacteria might be resistant to antibiotics, and a topic that's on the top of everyone's mind these days, whether someone might be infected with a virus. Next slide. And in fact, this CRISPR-based cell-free technology has recently been applied to make a rapid diagnostic test for COVID-19. Uh, if you've been following the news, you'll know that the need for a rapid diagnostic for COVID-19 is a real limiting factor that uh, prevents us from being able to respond to this pandemic. So COVID-19 is the disease that's caused by the SARS-CoV-2 virus, which is shown here on the left. Um, and researchers from a company called Mammoth Biosciences have recently developed a CRISPR test that can detect the presence of genes from the SARS-CoV-2 virus in a patient sample. This whole test takes just about 30 minutes and it has a very easy readout. You can see uh, an example of this at the bottom. There's these test strips and when a, a sample contains genes from the SARS-CoV-2 virus, there's a band at the top of the test strip and when there's not virus in the sample, no band is present. I think what's really remarkable here is that the genome of the SARS-CoV-2 virus, the first genome of this virus was published in December. And this company reported development of a diagnostic test uh, just a couple weeks ago in March. So in just three months, we can use cell-free technology to develop a new diagnostic test that's very fast, very easy to use, and that could really help us better understand the spread of this virus and understand how to combat it. And going even further on the next slide, um, this idea of cell-free diagnostics could also be applied really at the very front lines of the pandemic. So we talked about how cell-free systems can be freeze-dried in test tubes as well as on paper. It turns out these reactions can also be embedded into fabric. So you could imagine maybe making a lab coat or a face mask that contained a cell-free diagnostic sensor embedded within it. Um, and when a first responder like a healthcare worker or other um, professional were exposed to the virus, that diagnostic would change color. And this would allow us to very quickly identify who might be exposed to the virus and better help protect these people who are operating on the front lines. Now, this uh, technology, this wearable technology is still in development, but uh, this is an active and very exciting area of research in the cell-free space, so definitely watch this space uh, for future developments. And finally, uh, once we've been able to diagnose someone with a disease, we also, of course, want to be able to treat them. So because cell-free systems give us the power to carry out the central dogma to make proteins, we can also imagine using cell-free systems to make medicines and vaccines at the point of care, um, directly after someone's been diagnosed with a disease. This, uh, or during grad school actually, I worked on a technology that uses cell-free systems to produce antibacterial vaccines. My platform that I developed uses freeze-dried cell-free reactions that when you just add water will carry out all of the transcription, translation, um, and other biological processes needed to make a vaccine of, of interest. 
Uh, researchers from MIT have further expanded this uh, technology and showed that it can be used to make antimicrobial peptides, as well as um, a group at the University of, or at BYU actually, has shown that you can make anti-cancer reagents. And so all of this together kind of opens the door to uh, being able to synthesize medicines on demand. Because cell-free systems can be freeze-dried, they can be transported without refrigeration. And this is really important because the need for refrigeration has really prevented us from being able to distribute medicines and vaccines, especially in the developing world. So now you don't need expensive equipment or, or specialized expertise. You can imagine packaging these freeze-dried reactions in a small box or backpack and delivering them really all over the world. So once we do have a vaccine for something like COVID-19, uh, it's possible that cell-free technology could play a role in being able to distribute this vaccine very rapidly all over the world and help bring the pandemic to an end. Now, uh, we got a lot of questions about COVID-19 and uh, about the pandemic. I wanna just mention that uh, their mini PCR has done a really great webinar on COVID-19. You can find it on their YouTube page. Um, but for now, we're going to focus on uh, cell-free technology in particular. So I'll hand it back over to Allie to talk about how cell-free technology can be used in classrooms. All right. Thanks, Jess. Uh, let's see. Let's get this all set up. All right. Yeah. So when I first started grad school at MIT, I was looking around for labs to join. And I saw this news story in, on the MIT website about the work being done in Jim Collins's lab. And this is the work that was just on the previous slide, this idea of this portable biomanufacturing kit with cell free. And it sounded like science fiction magic to me, the fact that you had these freeze dried cell free reactions, no cells, you could just add water that had DNA in it, and then you would get DNA to RNA to protein, and then you could use this stuff for things like diagnostics and protein production. It just seemed so amazing to me. So I decided to join that lab and learn more. And once I joined the lab and started playing around these cell-free reactions, I realized that all this advanced technology was really just manipulating transcription and translation components in a tube you know, again, the ribosomes, the polymerases, you're simplifying it down to the fundamentals of molecular biology, like how they did back in the 60s. And I realized this could be a really powerful tool to demonstrate these basic molecular biology concepts to students in a really engaging and hands-on way that hadn't really been done before. Plus, you know, it's easy to use, low cost, so it's good for non-lab settings like your classrooms or at home. So my main project in graduate school was co-developing BioBits with Jess, which is using these freeze-dried cell-free reactions specifically for educational uses. And so we'll go through some of that work now. So while we were both in grad school, we developed a variety of different prototypes, just exploring what is even possible in the space of education. We wanted students to be able to detect all these different molecular processes that normally cannot be seen. So we knew that whatever protein these BioBit cell-free reactions were making should be something that's easily visible. So we thought of fluorescent proteins. So fluorescent proteins are a special type of protein that can absorb light. So they can absorb light like UV or blue LED light, and then emit that energy back as colored visible light. So if you ever say been bowling under a black light or like held highlighters under a black light, they all light up, that is fluorescence. And I actually have a couple examples of fluorescent proteins. With, whoop, okay, let me turn off my background. So you should be able to see it. Whoop. So these are uh, fluorescent proteins. I have them in this little box that's uh, exposing them to blue LED light right now. So that's why you're able to see all the different colors. So yeah, so I just made these cell-free reactions yesterday. All you do is you add the DNA that encodes for these different, uh, these, the different fluorescent proteins. 
again, the reaction will undergo transcription and translation, and then you get DNA to RNA to these really brightly colored fluorescent proteins. These are commonly used by scientists in regular molecular biology to light up things inside living cells. So we thought, why not use this to light up things in the cell-free system for students? And yeah, we found that this was really engaging for students because it's colorful and it's a really wow moment when students can actually turn on the light, see the fluorescent proteins that they made, and that's their light bulb moment. That's when they get it. Um, these fluorescent proteins are so easy to express that we make so much of it that you can actually see them by eye. Um, you can see that they're faintly uh, colored by eye, but they look much cooler under the blue light. So by adding DNA to these BioBit cell-free reactions, DNA will undergo transcription, which go to RNA, which will be translated, and you get the specific fluorescent protein encoded by the DNA. So it's obviously a very good tool for demoing things like gene expression and protein synthesis. And we can even expand on these basic concepts to make really engaging and highly visual fun labs. For example, one of the prototype proof of concept activities we came up with was this idea of having students design their own picture uh, made up of lots of different dots, basically. And so students will go, okay, if I want this color of protein here, what DNA and how much of it do I need to add to get that color here? And how do I do that for the rest of all my dots to get the picture I want? And so it's very engaging. Students are learning about transcription and translation, but you know, they're having fun being able to design a very, a very colorful picture as well. So the pictures you're seeing here are actual results by students and teachers that Jess brought into her lab to test out this activity. So yeah, you can see someone made a rainbow, someone made a periodic table, someone even made a Connect Four game. Um, so yeah, we can make science really fun using these BioBit cell-free reactions. Beyond just the basics too, we can we also prototyped a couple of activities that demonstrated more advanced biology topics, things getting into synthetic biology, such as biosensors and diagnostics, basically the things that Jess mentioned in the, her part of the talk. So many of you have probably done this in your classroom, the strawberry DNA extraction lab or the fruit DNA extraction lab. You take some fruit, you squish it up with some soap, you filter out the juice, you add rubbing alcohol and out pops this gloopy mess. And that gloopy mess is DNA. It's a great lab for showing kids and students, you know, all these things contain DNA, but it doesn't really show them what DNA can actually do. So we used BioBits to take this activity a couple steps further. So instead of stopping at this gloopy mess, as you've seen here, we actually first amplify that DNA. So make lots and lots of copies through a process called PCR or polymerase chain reaction. It's basically we're zooming in on a section of DNA and making lots and lots of copies of that one section. It's like when you take a book and you just use a copy machine to copy just one page out of that book. So we use the PCR protocol to copy out a section of DNA that we want from either uh, in this case, we use banana or we use kiwi DNA. And then we apply it to a, a biosensor. So these are the same sensors that Jess talked about previously. So these are the same type of sensors used in the Zika diagnostics. So what happens is, as a reminder, when you add this amplified DNA to your BioBits reaction, it will undergo transcription to become RNA. And then that RNA becomes the key to unlocking the biosensor, allowing it to undergo transcription and translation and get out a signal protein. In this case, we're using green fluorescent protein as our signal. So here we have a biosensor that specifically recognizes a segment of DNA in bananas. So when you put banana DNA into BioBits with the sensor, that whole process will happen and you'll get your green fluorescent protein out in the end. But when you try applying kiwi or strawberry DNA, nothing happens. We also made a similar one 
with kiwi. So again, if you put kiwi DNA onto this biosensor and biobits, it lights up, but not when you add banana or strawberry DNA. So all this seems pretty advanced, but it, it is still all uh, manipulating the processes of transcription and translation. And now we're just taking advantage of it to create this diagnostics. Obviously we're just using fruit here, but you could easily expand this and think about like pretend, you know, instead of the, these different fruits you're using, if you're testing different diseases and if the patients has these different diseases. So it's a great parallel to show how cell-free reactions could be used in diagnostics. And again, Jess also mentioned CRISPR. Many of you have probably heard of it, but may not know exactly what it does. Um, just as a very high level, CRISPR is a system that's made up of several parts. Uh, some of these parts are able to identify a very specific uh, section of DNA and other parts can actually cut the DNA. So essentially CRISPR is a system where it finds one aspect of DNA and cuts there. And then you can also add in other parts to add a cut and paste section. So you can actually edit in DNA to fix any typos in the DNA and genetic mutations and that kind of thing. So we wanted to create a prototype activity where it would demonstrate this specific cutting function of CRISPR. So what we did is first we used BioBits to make uh, a protein called Cas9 that is involved in this CRISPR system. And then we make, use also use it to make a couple other parts involved in the CRISPR system. And then when you add those parts to the DNA that it's targeting, it will cut that DNA. So in this case, we use uh, DNA that encodes for this red fluorescent protein. So when you add the CRISPR system to this DNA, it cuts the DNA. And then when you try adding that DNA to the BioBits reaction to do transcription and translation and make this red fluorescent protein, you can see this is what it looks like when without the CRISPR system. This is what it looks like when you add the CRISPR system. The DNA is cut and no longer can go DNA RNA to protein. And so you don't get any protein out at the end. And then we also add the same system to other DNA that encodes for other fluorescent proteins. But because this system, this particular system we're using, only targets the red fluorescent protein, when we try adding it to other DNA that encodes for other fluorescent proteins, you see nothing happens because the CRISPR system is very specific to whatever DNA sequence you are targeting. So this activity, uh, this prototype activity, is really good for showing exactly how CRISPR works. So all these different activities that we've shown so far are just prototypes and proof of concepts that we developed while in grad school. There is a, a lot of additional development needed to bring an actual prototype to the classroom as an actual product. So for our first product for BioBits, we decided to focus on a very fundamental molecular biology concept, the central dogma of molecular biology, basically how genetic information is transferred, how RNA is made from DNA through transcription, how proteins are made from RNA through translation. And again, since BioBits and cell-free technology is really just breaking down the cell to its most basic components of transcription translation, it's the perfect activity to start with. So we developed this into the BioBits Central Dogma Lab. It launched last September, and it's been used in many classrooms across the country already. And in this lab, students are able to see DNA go to RNA, go to protein in a single tube, and then actually can visualize all of the uh, reactions in real time, which is really cool. And if you actually want to see this lab in action, we are doing a another webinar next Monday, April 13th, same time. We'll send out more info about that later, but I'll be actually doing, I'll be actually doing the Central Dogma Lab live on camera so you guys can actually see how it's used in the classroom. So be sure to join us for that. It'll be really fun. I'll be pipetting on webcam and everything. It's gonna be great. Yeah, so just to sum it all up, I know that was a lot of information that we threw at you guys. Um, so 
Backing up, cells and other living systems have been used for thousands of years to make products. Living cells do present some challenges, however, in terms, in especially in terms of how complex they can be, in terms of accessibility. So cell-free systems are a great alternative because they can be cheaper, faster, and easier in order to do protein expression. Freeze-drying these reactions allow for easier transport and storage, so it would make it even more accessible for everyone. Cell-free technology has been applied to novel diagnostics and vaccine production, and specifically for us, we developed BioBits, which again is our low-resource cell-free platform to visualize molecular biology in classrooms and other non-lab settings. So, yeah, so we've reached the Q&A portion of our talk. Um, let's see, Jess, I'll unmute you so you can also talk as well. There you go. So a lot of you had submitted questions beforehand. So we went through the questions and we grouped them into different categories. And so we'll answer a few of, the, of those from here and then we'll take a look at the Q&A section from Zoom to see if there's anything we can answer from there. All right, so some people asked about what are, you know, we talked about drawbacks of using live cells and the advantages of using cell-free systems, but some people ask what are the drawbacks of using a cell-free system? Jess, do you wanna start with that? Yeah, so um, in terms of drawbacks, I guess, uh, cell-free systems don't scale as easily as cells, so it's, it's hard to make lots and lots of cell-free reactions. Um, that said, there are people both in industry and academia who are thinking about this, so um, that's an active area of research. Cell-free systems are also a lot newer than cell-based um, systems for making proteins so you know maybe it's there's not as much history there's not as much proven but um as ali mentioned cell-free systems have been being used since the 1960s so there's a lot of history there in terms of the benefits of cell-free systems for both understanding and using biology um, i think as we discussed in this in this talk, there are areas where cell-free systems can do things that cells can't do. They're more portable, um, they're more agile. So I think that uh, they can you can rapidly develop things like diagnostic tests. So I think you know rather than drawbacks, I might just put it as you know there might be a, a system that's best to use for your particular application. It might be better to use cells for certain things, but it mm could be advantageous to use cell-free systems for certain things as well. Yeah, exactly. Like just to piggyback off of that, um, a cell-free system, you do have limited resources in a cell-free system. Once your ATP, for example, runs out, then that's it. You can't really use that cell-free system anymore versus in a live cell, it can keep regenerating ATP, it can keep regenerating resources. So like Jess said, cell-free systems are useful when you just need to do a reaction once, for example, in a diagnostic testing a patient sample. So yeah. Another question that was asked, um, people were asking about using biobits and cell-free activities in their classrooms. Um, so like I mentioned, the current BioBits kit is one covering the Central Dogma Lab. So again, the Central Dogma of Molecular Biology is how genetic information is transferred from DNA to RNA to protein. Basically, how do, you know, how do proteins get made? And we have a really, really fun activity demonstrating this. And again, I'll be doing this for next week's webinar so you can see how it's specifically used. Um, we are also planning on launching more BioBits kits. We're envisioning a whole suite of BioBits kits in the future, uh, drawing upon some of the ideas that we have shown in the prototype, uh, all those different prototypes that we've shown before. So can't give too much away because I don't want to spoil the surprise, but we have a lot of exciting uh, BioBits activities coming down the line. 
Um, and at the end of this, we're also going to throw up a bunch of resources that you can use in your classroom uh, right now. I know a lot of you are teaching virtually. So we actually have a lot of virtual resources you can use to talk about BioBits and the cell-free reaction. And again, BioBits is something that's very easily portable. So it's not out of the realm of possibility that uh, you could actually do BioBits at home right now and demo it for your students. All right, so we actually had a, quite a few questions about how to get cell-free systems into research labs. So it looks like we have some researchers and scientists who are curious how to get this up and running. Um, if you scroll back up through the chat, we actually had linked a couple of papers and uh, there are a lot of peer reviewed papers out there with really detailed protocols talking about how you make cell-free extracts. So I, I know I went through it very, very briefly um, in my talk about how you do it, but there are all these great protocols out there. There's even videos that show you how you can do it. Uh, Sebastian just linked something um, in the chat right now. And uh, we only talked about actually um, cell-free extracts from bacteria cells. There are other cell-free systems out there. Uh, for example, I know New England Biolabs, our friends over there, have a cell-free system called Pure Express. Uh, that system is a little different. Instead of busting open cells and taking what is inside, they actually made each component of the cell-free system individually. So making the ribosomes, making the polymerases, and uh, purifying it all and combining it into one reaction that's called Pure Express. It's a little more expensive because it's a little more involved process, but it is a really good system for testing things that are new, especially if they're sensitive, like diagnostics. So I would check that out as well. Um, but yeah, just we'll link resources in the chat and yeah, there's so many different protocols out there about how to do this. Um, and yeah, just the best way is to just reach out to a cell-free lab, honestly, and talk to the people there and they can point you in the right direction. Jess, is there anything else you wanna to add to that? No, I think uh, you covered it. So Sebastian has linked a paper that was developed my, by my uh, PhD lab that uh, has a way to make cell-free extract with just a sonicator. So it's supposed to be a real simple method for making extracts that could be applied in many different lab settings. Not necessarily in a classroom, unless you have a sonicator in your classroom, but that is one option for research labs looking to get into it. And then I would emphasize um, the Pure Express system that Ali mentioned as a commercial option of a cell-free system um, that you could purchase and use in your classroom. Awesome. Uh, some people asked, can cell-free extracts be made from other types of cells uh, besides bacteria? So today's talk, we focus mostly on, uh, we pr pretty much all, all focused on just cell-free extracts made from bacteria. But yeah, it's definitely possible to make cell-free extracts from things like yeast. I've heard it from wheat germ. Um, Jess, I don't know if you've yeah, played around Yeah, really, um, it's an active area of research, creating new cell-free systems from cells, with, you know, new types of cells, uh, especially there's a buzzword called non-model organisms. So the idea that really most of the biology that we do is in E. coli or yeast and a little bit in mammalian cells, but um, we're not, you know, the palette of cells that we work with is really confined to a few model organ organisms or workhorse organisms that are very well understood. So cell-free, there's a lot of effort in the cell-free research space to develop systems from non-model organisms um, to help better understand those systems and the biology of those uh, other cells. So I think the, the list is growing longer every day of uh, different cells that have cell-free systems derived from them. But yeah, wheat germ, uh, there's human cells, there's uh, Cho Chinese hamster ovary cells, which are a workhorse in the pharmaceutical and biotech industries. Um, there's plant cells. Uh, really, you name it. So um, many, many different kinds. And actually, the wheat germ system I know is commercially available as well. So that's one we forgot to mention. Um, yeah. yeah, the E. coli bacteria cell extracts are the most extensively studied. So when you're looking for protocols online, 
more often than not, it's going to be on E. coli bacteria cell extract. But yeah, like Jess said, it's a growing field. People are trying other types of cells as well. Also, I would just mention that the bacterial systems are the highest yielding, meaning that they make the most protein. So for the applications like diagnostics, biosensors, and um, making medicines on demand, you need to make a lot of protein. So the bacterial systems are probably the best candidate. But if you're looking to study biology, some of these other systems can be very interesting as well. Yeah, and I don't know if people are checking out the Q&A section um, in Zoom, but check that out. We've been answering a lot of the questions there. Uh, for example, someone did ask, what about chaperones and post-translational modifications and whatnot? And that is actually something that's really interesting because for bacterial extract, they don't really have the same post-translational modification machinery as, say, a eukaryotic cell. And I know, Jess, you worked a little bit on, this is getting into like way advanced uh, science, but you worked a little bit in this field in your PhD as well, right? Yeah, so part of my PhD was building in the capability to do glycosylation, which is a specific and very important kind of post-translational modification in bacteria. So bacteria don't carry out glycosylation, but you can uh, express enzymes from other organisms in the, in the cell-free extract that would allow that post-translational modification to happen. Uh, in terms of chaperones, you can also express uh, things like disulfide bond isomerases for making disulfide bonds in bacteria. So um, kind of getting around the problem because the you, because eukaryotic cell-free systems don't make as much protein, could we take elements of eukaryotic systems and put them into the bacterial systems to make the bacterial systems more flexible? So that's also an active area of research. And just really quick, someone just at, asked what are chaperones. Chaperone proteins are proteins that help proteins fold, essentially. So after you make your protein, the protein needs to fold into its final shape in order to carry out its function. And so chaperone proteins just help that process. Cool. And then the final and probably most popular uh, category of questions, people wanted to know how cell-free technology can be used to address the current COVID-19 situation. Uh, Jess touched upon this in her part of the talk. And I also want to point you guys again to the webinar we did last Monday with Dr. Alex Danis, where she talked more generally about COVID-19 genetics and the science behind it. And we linked that webinar in the chat. So if you're just curious about COVID-19 in general, please check out that webinar. But again, um, the examples that Jess mentioned that you know, we cell-free technology is particularly powerful for diagnostics. So there's definitely room um, for people to potentially make a COVID-19 diagnostic. And I know people are working on that right now. Uh, the drawback right now is that it's a cell-free technology for diagnostic is a fairly new technology. So being able to get something up and running in time to address this um, may or may not work out, but we'll see what people can do. Yeah, watch the news. You might see yeah. cell-free diagnostics in the news soon. Yeah, I'm pretty sure both of our uh, labs that we got our PhD in are both working on this as well as other labs across the country right now. So people are working on it, so just stay tuned. And then, yeah. Um, and if there's any other lingering, lingering questions that didn't get answered, you guys are always welcome to contact us um, our last slide, we're going to link, you know, our social media. You can always reach out to this there and ask these questions and we'll get back to you. Uh, but as promised, uh, we have lots of great resources for teaching cell-free technology in the classroom. Uh, we are going to link, uh, I think it either has been linked in the chat already, um, a whole page of virtual resources that are very helpful for, you know, teaching cell-free bio bits and whatnot, it just got linked right there. Uh, but I just wanted to point out specifically DNA dots. So DNA dots are something at mini PCR that we write. They are, one, they are two page simple explanations of common genetic techniques, things like CRISPR, sequencing, that kind of thing. And so students would read the two page explanation and then answer study discussion questions at the end. And these are all free on our website. So if you go to this link that I'm showing right here, we actually wrote one on cell-free tech, cell-free protein synthesis. So if you're interested in distributing this to your students, 
please check that out. And if you go to the link that was just posted in the chat, we have tons of other resources as well. We have basic primers on cell-free technology, including that DNA dots that I just talked about. We have information about our current BioBits kits and how to use them in your classroom. Uh, we also linked the BioBits papers that we published in grad school. So Jess and I published uh, together three different BioBits papers talking about all these different prototype activities. They're open access, so you don't have to pay anything to see them. And so the links to those papers are there if you want a deeper dive into the science behind BioBits and how cell-free works. And then we have other cell-free resources as well. So we have some news articles talking about the Zika diagnostics um, and that kind of thing if you want to dig into how that works as well. Uh, but beyond that, thank you for listening. Um, our social media handles are here for both mini PCR um, and our BioBit specific one. So if there are any questions that didn't get answered, uh, you can reach out to us through this or the emails as well. Um, I think uh, if the moderator wants to throw an email into the chat that we can use to contact. Um, but yeah, we had a lot of fun talking about this and hopefully this was useful. Hopefully it's something you can share with your students, um, especially since, you know, cell-free technologies could be very relevant and right now for creating diagnostics, we wanted to kind of share the science behind that. All right, so just as a reminder, next week I'll be doing the BioBit Central Dogma li Lab live uh, in a webinar, and we will follow up later this week with more information about how to sign up for that and how to watch that. Um, but yeah, thank you, Jess, for joining me. I had a lot of fun talking about this. Thank you for having me. Happy to be here, and thanks everyone who tuned in for sharing this part of your Monday with us. All right. Sounds good. Have a great rest of your week, guys.